Hello, and welcome to another episode of Boundless Body Radio. I'm your host, Casey Ruff, and today we have another amazing guest to reintroduce to you now. Dr. Kevin Stock is a returning guest on our show. Be sure to check out his first appearance on episode 326 of Boundless Body Radio. Dr. Kevin Stock is a dentist who has been on a lifelong mission to discover how to bring the highest levels of health and fitness to himself and to his patients. This quest has led him to be an advocate for a meat-based carnivore diet. As his health experimental researcher, he has been passionate about, about health and fitness for two decades. He was a national level physique competitor and created the Meat Health Platform. He began his professional dental career as a dental sleep medicine doctor, where he treated obstructive sleep apnea in his private practice. He invented the NED device, an intranasal device designed to treat snoring and obstructive sleep apnea. He also does pediatric dentistry through Smiles America. He's an active writer, reader, and researcher on topics from health and fitness to science and philosophy. He shares his findings on his fantastic newsletter called The Saturday Seven, which is one of my absolute favorites. And he also shares his progress with his annual and infamous challenges. Dr. Kevin Stock, after that terrible introduction stumbling through... Well, it is such an honor to welcome you to Boundless Body Radio. Hey, thank you for having me on. And that was a, a fantastic introduction. Thank you. It uh, sounds like a very uh, dis disheveled life I lead. <laughs> lead. <laughs> well, I had to shorten it from last time. Um, I didn't mention that you wrote a book. I didn't mention that you had a wonderful podcast. You kept active for a very long time. And I have to say, just going back and listening to some of your older episodes today, stuff holds up, man. You did a really good job getting the science right. I don't think you would probably go back and correct a lot of things now. Thank you. That means a lot. And I think before I publish things, I spend an insane amount of time ensuring like my beliefs and what I'm writing are quite strong. Not that I would not change my mind. I think that's important to do in certain cases, but not to post something to the general public unless I have a pretty strong conviction in it. <laughs> well, that's great. You did such a good job with that. I really appreciate that. I really appreciated the opportunity of meeting you in person at KetoCon 2023. Likewise wonderful to see you and i just have to say like you, you hear the stories of the people meeting their hero maybe it's an actor an athlete and a person is a total asshole and i just have to say like everybody in this community by and large including yourself have been so wonderful to meet you you guys are so good in person as you are presenting your information on podcasts and all the different ways that you connect with people so it was really really cool to finally meet you in person well it was great meeting you and i appreciate that and a lot of the people in this space that i've gotten to know behind the scenes and at conferences like this like everyone's core motivation is really like hey we want to figure out this health stuff a lot of times for ourselves and we figure it out or and then you know to pass it along like that's the whole point <laughs> Yeah, totally. What was your favorite part about the conference this year? Man, the conference was really, um, it was bang, bang, bang for me because I couldn't get in until Friday. And so then there was a dinner Friday night. Saturday, I was talking. Sunday, I was on the Carnivore Doctor panel. So it was bang, bang, bang. And in the midst of that, I am a, you might know, like I, I'm a workaholic because not in a bad way, I guess, but in like, I love what I do. So I'm just like always working. And my girlfriend, she loves to go on vacation and trips. And like, I'm always like, no, nah, that kind of pulls me away from my work. So anyways, <laughs> she went on the trip with me, but I, I had to turn it into a, a work vacation trip. So, you know, we explored Austin. We ate at some good places. Austin's a fun place. So it was a combination of like all these things happening, put a little vacation time in there uh, and then ha headed back out Sunday. So it, it was a fast trip. <laughs> Wow. Well, that's a good balance between having fun and being at the conference and being available. You stayed for, you know, however long I waited to say hi to you and answered everybody's questions and very approachable that way. One of the downsides of KetoCon is that there's so much going on all at once. So it was it was kind of hard to make decisions about like where you'd want to go and what you'd want to see. I that is. Yeah, exactly. Because the. Uh... The vendor part is so, first of all, it's fantastic. Like all the vendors and stuff, you, you know, I it's great. But like, I get to see all these people like, hey, for example, other people that have podcast, hey, let's do a 10 minute segment or a 20 minute segment. Uh, and then it's like trying to get it all orchestrated, organized when there's all these things going on. It, that, that was kind of tough. <laughs> As part of the vendors uh, were the Peterson Farms people who were cooking up bacon and sausage the entire time. I, I just like would walk back and forth and back and forth <laughs> and just sample all this stuff. Okay, um, I don't want to put words in your mouth. I just want to ask you anecdotally, observation-wise, did you notice during that conference that there was an, how do I describe it, like an extra energy around carnivore that wasn't necessarily in the keto space? For sure. I'd say for the last two years, I mean, I've, I've gone the last two years and in 2022, 
uh, I was on the carnivore panel in 2022 and also the fitness panel, just like the general keto fitness panel. And even the questions for the fitness panel were like, Hey, I'm carnivore. Hey, I'm carnivore. I want to do. So it just seemed like yeah, it's turning into car- carny con carnivore con. <laughs> uh, so I, I, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's the impression I get. Even hmm. I feel like a lot of the, I'll say prominent keto people are carnivore ish at least. And I think it makes a lot of sense because if you're doing keto and you're eating, I'll say, good fats, you're more or less going to be carnivore. Like the way to do a keto diet bad is eat a lot of vegetable oils, (laughs) right? (laughs) So, and I think most of the keto advocates are like, realize, Hey, we don't want to eat tons of soybean oil. (laughs) That that, that could be a ketogenic diet, but that's not the kind of keto we want to be on. So they start like gravitating towards carnivore anyhow. Totally. It's part of that natural progression that you kind of see with most people. Okay. uh, Standard American sucked. So I heard of paleo. I tried paleo. I lowered my carbs. I lowered my carbs. Well, now I'm kind of keto. Keto helped me lose weight. I feel good. Like I got better energy. My sleep's a little better, but I still have these niggling things that are kind of hanging on. I still get the joint pain. My digestion isn't great. I'm going to try carnivore 30 days later, all those niggling problems drop out. And you've kind of found like at least the baseline of a diet for the rest of your life. I exactly. I, I, that is such a common progression right there. They like almost kind of like similar to my story, but, but yeah, that's kind of the route that a lot of people have gone. Like you said, I think people find carnivore like, holy cow. And there's lots of re- revelations there. And then the, at least, I don't know about the percentage of people that stay carnivore, but almost everyone I know that has gone carnivore has at least stayed carnivore ish. Meaning like, man, I found the foundation of my baseline. It is a lot of this red meat where prior myself included ate little to no red meat. Uh, and so it's not a small change, actually. It's a pretty drastic diet change, <laughs> uh, but it makes all the difference. Yeah, totally. You hear about vegans transitioning over carnivore. I don't know one single carnivore that knows one single carnivore that went from carnivore to even like more plant-based ish, or even shows like lots of vegetables, you know? Yeah, exactly. The, the only people I know have, that have kind of swung higher on the carb side and they would tend to do it with fruits um and not so much like let's eat lots of vegetables uh so yeah (laughs) well anyway with with keto con you did have to make decisions about what you wanted to see when i saw that you were a presenter i knew exactly that that is where i was going to be i was not the only one that made that decision you packed (laughs) the house with people it was kind of a bummer because i had to go to probably our mutual friend bronson dant and tell him since he was presenting at the same time like dude i'm so sorry i can't see you and natalie's presentation but i've been earmarking this one for months i gotta go watch <laughs> kevin so my strategy since i i missed a few and i also haven't seen any of the content that that was presented there it's now been a few months my strategy has been to invite all of you back onto this show to <laughs> capture part of your presentation, keep it in podcast land. And then if nobody ever listens to it again, at least I'll have it selfishly and I can listen to it anytime I like. That's awesome. Hey, I think that's a great strategy. We were talking about before, uh, and I'll just, so Robin who organized KetoCon asked at least maybe the main presentations that we don't post publicly on YouTube because there's like a virtual pass uh, that people had the option to purchase which totally understandable, but that if we could post it, uh, get more privately. So my presentation, I, I will have private access for people. They can watch it free, but it just won't be public YouTube access. Yeah, that's amazing. And Robin, we've had her on the show as well. She's such a sweetheart. She did such a good job putting on the the conference. And yeah, that it is totally understandable that she want to you know protect the content in some way for the people that didn't you know invest a few bucks and try to see some of these wonderful presentations if you couldn't be there. In person, before we go to the presentation, though, let's remind our listeners your story into health, how you found carnivore, and, you know, how that kind of worked itself in an interesting way into what you do for your day job, which is dentistry. Yeah, and I kind of weaved it through in into the presentation, because I I, try, I I wanted to have, like, the main content, but also how that content came to be, uh, because my story started as... I like to say this health and fitness journey, but it really was just a fitness journey to start. I was an overweight kid really didn't want to be overweight, which led to me doing all kinds of weird diets. I'm talking 12, 13 years old doing like weird stuff. Uh, and in, as in, by my senior in high school, we have to write a senior thesis at the high school I went to. I wrote a 50 plus page research paper on the obesity remedy. Went to college. I got my degree in chemistry, minor in biology, just so I could funnel the sciences through. How can I build muscle and lose fat? It's like, so there's a big obsession. By the time I was in dental school, I was actually like, I felt like I had a good grasp of 
health and fitness where I really had a good grasp of fitness. Uh, but I, so I did physique competitions in, in dental school and where I'll say the tide started to turn was I realized I really wasn't feeling good. So I, I had a body I was very happy with. I could coach people, have them get great body compositions too. Like I felt like I really had the fitness down, but I needed to get the health side of the equation down, which took, which took me down a path to, to redoing keto again. I like to say, we don't need to go through that whole story, but eventually, uh, turning back to research I've done, removing plant-based toxins, Bruce Ames work, a lot of other people's work that, uh, I would say inspired me to like, Hey, let's get rid of oxalates. Let's get rid of various polyphenols, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. When you start getting rid of a few of these prominent plant compounds that can cause problems, you quickly start eating just meat. So by mid 2017, I was just eating meat, never felt better in my entire life. And for the first time, by the way, I started eating red meat at that time, because one thing you realize you start removing plants, my previous diet, which was heavy and chicken lean meat, I, I'm smart enough to know, thankfully, like I can't just survive on chicken breast. I need a fat source. And so I was just managing doing eggs and I started eating red meat in any significant quantity and like pulling those two levers, like getting rid of the plant foods, increasing the fatty meat I was eating, uh, dude, it felt so good. Started writing about, uh, why I was doing this at all over the blog, started meat health and I, the rest is kind of history <laughs> from there. Yeah. No, that's amazing. I notice sometimes like parts of the year, like now we're recording in summertime, I am drawn a little bit more to kind of leaner protein sources, like I'll cook up chicken breast. I, I don't always crave it, but just sometimes in the summer. But for example, if I have exclusively chicken breast for my dinner at night, and I've got an early morning hockey game the next day, I am flat. I do not mm. skate really well. I, I have to have eggs, red meat the night before a high performance. So you can kind of modulate that a little bit based on what your body needs and what you're craving. I believe your body can tell you what it intuitively needs if you pay attention to that. But it's a good point that if you're just trying to do this on lean meat, you're going to be an unhappy camper. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, especially so I, I still like to play with body composition stuff. And right now I'm actually in the midst of a long carnivore bulk. I am uh, with 10 months, 11 months into it where I'm, I'm grads, I'm purposely gaining weight. And so over the last 10 months, I'm like up 20 pounds or something like that. I still got wow. 10 or so pounds I want to go. So the, the goal, it's going to be at least an 18 month bulk, but like right now I would normally, I would normally would have been like doing a little minor cut in the spring, increasing lean meats, decreasing fat counts a little bit and lean out for the summer. It's a hundred degrees right now. It's nice to be a little bit leaner in the summer anyhow. Uh, but right now I'm actually the heaviest I've been in, in quite some time and I'm hot. <laughs> Is that uncomfortable to put on that much weight? No, it's very easy for me. Like I, I tell people that with carnivore, I've done experiments within carnivore where I do cuts and get really lean and I've bulked up before, uh, but not, not this long of a bulk, but both the bulking and the cutting to me has been easier on carnivore. Like I can, I can keep moving my appetite up and I have introduced raw milk for the first time recently during this bulk, which has helped like bump calories up. Uh, but cutting and getting lean is also easier on carnivore versus like traditional bodybuilding, at least for me, where traditional bodybuilding, I would be wiped, hungry. And when I do a cut on carnivore, my I'm less hungry and less tired, I'd say. <laughs> yeah, interesting. Bronson Dant is getting a lot of airtime on this episode, but he told us the same thing. Like before he found carnivore, it was like you could choose, you could be lean but you'd feel terrible or you could feel amazing and feed yourself and look terrible. So yeah. this is the only way I've ever found. It sounds like you too, that you can kind of have your, your cake and eat it too, your steak and eat that, it too. I that's what I say. The converse is the only way I found you can have your steak and eat it too. I Meaning you can have a really good body composition and feel pretty good. That said, some people like probably myself and I mean, probably a lot of men under 10% body fat is what we're maybe some of us want, would love to look like all year, but no matter what you're doing, the body doesn't want to be there. So you won't feel that good. Uh, so there is that kind of caveat I'll throw in there, but in general speaking, looking, you know, good and feeling good to optimize both of those. There's probably no other way besides a very heavy meat based diet. Yeah, I agree. If there is another way, I certainly haven't found one. I Exactly. If, if there was, I would have, you know, I'm sure I w probably would have landed on, I've done every imaginable <laughs> kind of diet you can think of to, to, you know, try and land on these things. But I think, uh, you know, a carnivore diet, if you want to have the body composition as well as feel good, it's probably your way to go. <laughs> yeah. Well, if that is coming from you, I think that's very valid. You have tried a lot of stuff over the years. 
Um, okay, so tell us about the presentation. Tell us what the title is and why did you decide to speak on the topic that you did? So the title is called Meat Mouth and it's clues hiding right under your nose about what we should, should or shouldn't be eating. Uh, so basically what do our teeth say we should eat was the title I wanted to have, but the teeth, it goes beyond just what our teeth, it's what our mouth is telling us we should eat. And so in the presentation, I go through three clues that, hey, I can look in your mouth. I can see three things that are going on that are telling us like, hey, you shouldn't be eating that. Or maybe we, you know, so they help steer diet by just looking in the mouth. Cavities, malocclusion, and fatty tongue. Uh, so these are the three clues that I can see. I can look in your mouth. And if you have cavities, I have a good idea that I know it causes them. So maybe that should tell us we, we shouldn't be eating so much of the foods that causes cavity, cavities, malocclusion, the research around malocclusion is so interesting. Uh, and I think that was like new information for a lot of people, but malocclusion, crooked teeth, most people think it's just genetic, but the evidence doesn't support that. Uh, the evidence overwhelmingly supports that uh, it's a change in modern food that has caused malocclusion. So, Hey, what was that change that, that happened in the industrial revolution? Where butter, we, started we started eating butter. <laughs> so then the third clue was fatty tongue. And this is where, uh, so you mentioned I, after dental school, I graduated, I started dental sleep medicine practice as a niche area of dentistry of treating sleep disordered breathing. So it ranges from snoring to obstructive sleep apnea and obstructive sleep apnea is, is really caused by two things. One is the shrinking mouth. That's a clue too. That's malocclusion. Uh, but also the obesity. It's the combination of these two things, which we have this epidemic of sleep disordered breathing. Uh, so these three clues, we add up in the presentation to, to, hey, if we just look at these three clues, we add those clues together, what do we get? We get a meat-based diet. <laughs> Don't want to give away the punchline, but we get that we should be eating far fewer carbohydrates, especially refined carbs and sugars. Those causes cavities. Uh, malocclusion, the way to prevent malocclusion, we need to be chewing, we need to be eating high nutritious, species-appropriate diet that requires chewing and, uh, and breastfeeding, you know, uh, and we can get into more of the details, but breastfeeding plays an important role in prevention of malocclusion because one, it's the ideal nutrition, but two, it also forces the baby to use the oral facial muscles. That's going to stimulate the proper growth. Um, so those are the three clues you had, you had, you asked another question. I'm, I'm not sure if I answered it, but that was the title. Uh, we talked about the three clues. Uh, I've been thinking about this subject material for years. Uh, and my plan was prior to giving the presentation, like last year, I was like, I think I want to put all these ideas into a book uh, because I feel like these are the ideas I need to express uh, how the mouth can tell us what we should be eating uh, from. So it's like a dentist perspective. When I look in the mouth, I see all these things that tells us, Hey, you're di You shouldn't be eating that. Uh, and there's clues that I, this presentation went through three, but there's, there's a lot more. Uh, and so when Robin sent me a message to ask if I would talk, I was like, okay, it forced me to take these ideas that I've been researching for a long time and like, Hey, let's organize it into a presentation, uh, and present it in a way that is, I'll say digestible, uh, cause sometimes I, I will I will venture too often to like, hey, let's go into too much of the evidence, the research. People are bored by it, so it was a it was a it was a good thing for me to like, hey, let's organize these ideas. Uh, and so I, you know, I was excited to to do the presentation and and jump on the stage and talk about it. Uh, and so, yeah, that, that, that that's kind of how it came to be. That's great. No, that answered both questions. What was it about? What was the title and why you chose to talk about it? Before we deep dive into each one of those three things, what is the state of the state? Like, are you, we talked to you last year, we talked about, you know, the things that you deal with as a dentist. Where are we at with dentistry? What are you observing? Are we getting better? Are people learning this stuff? Are we worse? Is it about the same? Like, what are you observing? The state of dentistry, like the profession as a whole? Yeah, yeah. Like the things that you're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. I think the state of dentistry as a whole is very similar to just modern medicine in general. Like it is a slow moving machine and there's a lot of, I will say conf conflicts of interest, uh, you know, kind of like medicine where look, <laughs> people, dentists, doctors, whatever, we're making money off people not being healthy. <laughs> like dentist, if you're not going to have any cavities and you're not going to need fillings, you're not going to need root canals, you're not going to need bridges and dentures, you know, like, 
like dentistry would, you know, cease to exist. Right. So I'm not saying I think most dentists are mean well, and they don't need to like our diet is so bad in the modern world that being a dentist is, it is the most secure job in the world. You're good. <laughs> so it's like, uh, they don't need to try and like sell you on treatment. Like the, the, we, there's plenty of need for dentists. Uh, but the state of, I, you know, the state of dentistry in general is, and I talk about, I, I always take, we have, as dentists, we have to take 50 hours of continuing education every year or every two years. And so the continuing education I always take is on, if they ever have a nutrition course, I'm in it. Like I'm taking every CE course on oral health and nutrition. And over the last few years, they're all the same, uh, meaning they're the same in that they say, hey, we know what causes cavities. It's carbohydrates, bacteria in your mouth ferment carbohydrates into acid and they cause cavities. And so like, we know that we know, like that is what causes cavities. Now there's other things like that will make it worse, like mouth breathing, dry mouth. So if you're taking drugs or you have like chemotherapy or something like that's gonna give you really dry mouth, it's gonna severely predispose you to cavities. Fundamentally though, cavities are caused by bacteria in the mouth, fermenting carbohydrates into acid. Like that's it. Uh, and yet, so you would think that because of this, and by the way, which I think is helpful, cavities are the most common disease in the world. Like more so, it, it is the most common non-communicable disease in the world. Up to 90% of people have dental cavities. And so you would think we know the cause, carbohydrates. It is the most prevalent disease in the world. You would think like we would be saying, hey, we need to cut back on carbohydrates, right? <laughs> or at the very least, like we need to be cutting back on sugar and refined you know, grains. And maybe dentists will go that far. But even in these CE courses where they talk about nutritional counseling, they might recommend like, hey, tell your patients to reduce sugar, but they're still recommending, they, they are not recommending a low carb diet yet, which to me, if you're a dentist, like you should be recommending a low carb diet, like that, the evidence supports that. Uh, so that, that's the, my, like the state of dentistry. Like that's where I think that's where, that's where my head goes. This is exactly why when people say like doctors and dentists and medical professionals need more training in nutrition, they don't get enough. They need to get more. Everybody in the low carb world seems to be on board with that. I'm not on board with that because they would just get, get more indoctrinated in the wrong information. It, it reminds me. It reminds me of a podcast I listened to on the daily. I've talked about this a few times. It was released in January and it was all about childhood obesity. And they called so many things right. We didn't have childhood obesity in the 60s. It became a problem in the 70s and 80s. We went to school districts. We told one school district to exercise and eat more fruits and vegetables. The other school district, we did nothing. Everything we, we told this school district, the first one, was like what we thought was going to improve health. They were both the same. So by that conclusion, obesity is genetic. And now you need counseling at age two if you're expressing symptoms of obesity. You get ozempic at age 12 and you get bariatric surgery at 13. Really? Man, that's actually a great point. Like, because it, it's a double-sided problem. We do need all these healthcare professionals to be educated in nutrition. And obesity plays a role in almost every single healthcare, like no, no matter where you're practicing in healthcare, like obesity is a thing, uh, is a concern. Like I talk about in the presentation, like how obesity dentists need to be concerned about obesity because we can see it directly in the mouth and it has dire consequences of airway obstruction. Like, so if we're not concerned about obesity, I don't think we're doing our job. But like you said, if we go to get continuing education, they're, I would argue not teaching the right thing. <laughs> A so equals like, B, we... B equals G. What? Like, yeah, exactly. So, uh, you know, how to solve that um, problem? Like, th that that's that's a tough problem because yeah. I'm always because science doesn't work by consensus. So you don't want to say, oh, now we this is consensusly like this is the consensus healthy diet. Uh, we don't want to get there, but right now I feel like it seems yeah. like no one has any idea. Yeah. <laughs> It's so bad. It's so bad. And you said something interesting as well. And I've always heard this, that like the dentist is really seeing the front edge of, of poor health. So you are an advocate of at least the dentist recommending a low carbohydrate diet. They can talk about diet and recommend that, that people change need more proteins and fats versus the carbohydrates that I'm on board with that. That sounds great. Yeah. I, I, I feel like the issue is a lot of dentists feel like it's not their role. Like it's strange because we are 
basically required to do nutritional counseling, but at the same time, I feel, I feel like most dentists would say, if I'm recommending low carb, I'm out of my lane, so to speak. And so I'm like, it's kind of a direct conflict because like, I, I'm thinking, look, cavities, most common disease in the world caused by carbohydrates. We're required to do nutritional counseling. A plus B plus C equals low carb diet. Like it's not that complicated, but uh, yeah, I, I, I think there's a... I think it's a long road ahead for just healthcare in general. Uh, yeah. Because I, I don't see any kind of consensus in the right way. Like anything besides like what you just said, like that's, that's what, that's where it sees like everything's moving. Yeah. <laughs> like, is there a pill or a shot for this? Because we can't do anything about it. Totally. And the food is so delicious. I don't want to stop eating it anyway. <laughs> exactly, like, exactly. yeah, it's crazy. Okay. So cavities, you called it a disease and I, I, for me in my childhood, it was so prevalent. I always had one. I, to think of it as a disease is a little bit interesting to think that way. Dude, thank you for saying that. Because in the presentation, I don't know if it got across, but I was like, because we've normalized cavities, like it seems like like I ca you call it a disease, it takes someone, they're like, what? But it, it is so normalized. It's such a normalized disease that we think it's normal to have cavities and it's like not a problem. It's not, it's not a sign that something is wrong. Like, but when your child has cavities, you should be thinking like, Whoa, what is wrong? Like this is not normal, but cavities are normal. So, and I, I actually think that is one of the ways to, cause all parents, I should I, hesitate to say all, but almost all parents, they, they really care for their children. And so if a parent did know like, Hey, a cavity is a sign that too much of a bad food and or malnutrition, like most parents are going to be concerned. Like, how do we fix this? And that is a gateway to a better diet. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Okay. So again, observation, but would you say that changing the diet does more for dental health than say the standard practice, um, kind of dental hygiene things that we're told like brushing, flossing, obviously like all of it has its place. Um, where, where do you kind of rate the importance of those things? That's a good question. And I liken it unto, let's say you have a bad diet and, and, but you hit the gym for an hour every day, hardcore, you are doing cardio, like you are busting it activity. You're in the sun, you're sleeping, but your diet is, is terrible. Well, you can get away with that for probably a long time, at least through your youth. Right. Um, so I like an oral hygiene to that where it's like, Hey, if you don't have a good diet, you can prevent cavities and downsides by brushing twice a day, you know, using paste and chemicals and, you know, doing all the traditional oral healthcare stuff, you know, floss and all, all the stuff, right. That can help mitigate a bad situation. But if you're doing everything right on the diet side, all this other stuff is a lot of times superfluous, um, cosmetic even. So I, I, of course, think diet is, is primarily important because I actually think these problems, we don't want to just mask them. So for example, I think fluoride is a good example. Let's say fluoride was effective. And I wrote a long article on this, mildly effective maybe. Uh, but one of the concerns early on in fluoride research was, hey, cavities are a sign of a vitamin or mineral deficiency. It's a sign of malnutrition. We don't want to mask that up with some fluoride chemical because back then, and this is in the early 20s or in the mid 20th century, it was, I won't, it, it was known like, hey, the mouth is the canary in the coal mine. Like if we're getting cavities, this is other stuff could be going wrong like that, right? So if we're just masking this with chemicals or paste and fluorides and whatever, um, you could be masking an underlying problem and we don't want to do that. Uh, so long answer to your question, but I, would, I, would, I, I think diet is primarily important. Primarily. And depending on how much that diet is off depends on how important this oral hygiene strategy needs to be. Yeah, that's very interesting. And yeah, so many things in health, we do cover up the root cause. So that's an interesting way to think of um, cavities in that way. Now, if somebody, you know, is just hearing this for the first time, they're thinking like, okay, I can't do low carbohydrate diets. Maybe it's not like on their radar just yet. Is there like, you know, you mentioned sugar. Is it fructose? Are there certain carbohydrates that are more egregious or is it pretty much just carbohydrates ferment? That's kind of what they do. Are you talking about just with just with respect to cavities or just overall health? Just, let's stick with cavities. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, yeah we can go down that rabbit hole too, but yeah. That is, a that is a big rabbit hole. Uh, it's the simple sugars. 
uh, and there's a few things that de- uh, that really determine how bad it is. One is, you know, the fr- the sugar. What what is it? Simple sugar. Yeah, those are fermentable in the mouth rapidly. Going to convert to acid. Drop the pH below five point five. Cause demineralization of the enamel and cavities. Okay, so sugar that. Now, so sugar, simple sugar, more surface area than say some complex starch that, you know, amylase is going to start breaking down these starches in the mouth. So it's going to drop the pH. It's going to put you at higher risk for cavities, but it's not as high of risk as these simple sugars and refined carbs. So those are primary risk. Secondary importance is frequency. So each time you eat, uh, let's just say some sugar. And one of the worst things is, uh, and actually it's a, a good way to think about this is like, what's the worst thing you can do for your teeth. And that's kind of how you understand what's, <laughs> what's, that? and the worst thing is like sugar, uh, beverages like soda or like, um, I'm trying to think of the one that had the, the greatest, I'm, I'm drawing a blank. I think it was Red Bull, like a sugar Red Bull. Anyways, you drink a sugar Red Bull one, it has the sugar. So that's going to convert to acid Two it's a drink. So you're not chewing. So you're not stimulating saliva. Saliva is a protective factor. Three is it's already acidic. So it has malic acid, citric acid, it has acid in it. So it's already an acidic drink. So it's producing acid from the sugar. It's also an acidic drink already. And then if we sip on it throughout the day, these acid attacks, I think it was Red Bull. It's like 27 minutes or 30 minutes, whatever it was. So it causes the acid in your mouth, the pH to drop. So you get a more acidic environment for 30 minutes, every sip. And so if you just guzzle it once, you get a 30 minute attack and it's over. Saliva can come in, start trying to help clean up the mess and start remineralizing the teeth. But if you're sipping it every 30 minutes throughout the day, that acid attack goes on all day long. And so it's not only what you are consuming, it's how you're consuming it, drinking versus chewing, and it's how frequently you're consuming it. And then the duration as well. So did you do that once or do you do, do you sip on a Red Bull all day, every day? And so these are the factors that are really going to determine like how bad of a situation you're in. Yeah. And again, we're just sticking with the mouth, but think about the insulinogenic effect of doing that with that frequency. It's going to have a whole other host of problems. It's ironic too, because the main ingredient that Red Bull is named for is taurine. Where do you get taurine? Hmm. You could just get it from meat. Interesting that you mentioned blood sugar because uh, one very strong correlation is how much it decreases the pH. So how much it makes your mouth more acid is a strong correlation with how much it uh, spikes blood sugar. Yeah, <laughs> so wow. we have that kind of direct correlation. And a lot of these things in the mouth correlate strongly with like periodontal disease and heart disease and Alzheimer's. There's a lot of correlations which I think just all point to what we talked a little bit about is like this mouth is the canary in the coal mine problems happen here first. It's an early warning system. It's like, Whoa, diets off. And then the damage that we see early in the mouth later appears, you know, years, decades down the road, you know, as heart disease or dementia or et cetera. Yeah. That's a really good point. And again, we focus on the sugar with the things you shouldn't have, but what about the protein and the benefits of having protein in the diet for improving mouth health? I I mean, proteins, obviously we need for, all <laughs> for all kind of you know total body health as well and proteins actually can broke down and create an alkaline environment as well in the mouth so it can actually help remineralize teeth so these proteins are important when you're chewing protein like we mentioned it stimulates saliva saliva is going to be your primary remineralization fluid so we, we think remineralization most people's brain goes straight to fluoride maybe hydroxy appetite if they're like on the cutting edge of like hey i need to remineralize my teeth uh, but really saliva is going to be your go-to thing. So this is why, like we talked about earlier, mouth breathing is just terrible for cavities. Uh, and so saliva is basically the pool that's washing your teeth, that's remineralizing, keeping them healthy. And part of having healthy saliva is uh, the vitamin and mineral content of the saliva. So all, your diet plays an important role in creating healthy saliva as well. Yeah, that's such a good point. Is there anything we missed as far as cavities go? No, I think just in the presentation, I had, there's a few things that I wasn't able to fit in and by the way, in the presentation, my, my initial rough draft was over two hours. I'm like, I had to cut this down, cut it down, cut it down, cut it down. Cause I, I was told I have 40 minutes and they preferred it to be 30 minutes. So there's 10 minutes of Q and a, so I took this probably two, three hour presentation, cut it down to 30 minutes. So I had to leave some stuff out. Uh, one of the things I had to leave out was, you know, I said the cause of cavities is carbohydrates, which is true, but 
what is not often appreciated, what we just touched on is there's also the protective mechanism to cavities. So vitamin D has been, and this was like, vitamin D was, if you go back into, you know, the 1940s, 50s research, so like vitamin D is like this very important. It's the only kind of prophylactic prevention of cavities. And so this is just to say the carbohydrates and the acid are the attack, but how strong the defense is plays an important role. And to have a strong defense has a lot to do with your diet, the vitamins and minerals in your diet. Oh, that's such a good point. And you, I, I'm guessing you didn't eliminate a single word. You just spoke at Kevin Stock speed and was able to squeeze everything in the whole two-hour presentation. Uh, I okay, did so warn. I did warn you at the you beginning did. to say it was like, I got 30 minutes and I got two hours of stuff I want to, you know. And really, it's important to me because I, you know, like flying there, hotel, food. People are spending a lot of money to be here, and it's like. I want to deliver. Like I feel pressure to deliver because I know a lot of people, they sacrifice a lot of stuff to show up and be there. And like you said, you had to skip out on Bronson's talk to go to mine. I felt like I had to deliver. So I'm like, look, I'm going to talk fast so we can get the most bang for your buck. I'm, I'm <laughs> glad you did. It's the number one criticism I get on my show is I just talk way too fast. I'm like, yo, I'm sorry. I get really excited. So turn the speed down. You'll be fine. <laughs> turn the speed down. Exactly. I always watch videos on 2X speed. So yeah, I, I, like, I like a fast talker. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Everything else seems glacial after you do that. It's so it slow. It seriously does. <laughs> uh, let's talk about malocclusion. I think this is one of the more fascinating aspects of where things like breathing and diet meet dental health. I think a lot of people are surprised to see all these things kind of converging on, on this one thing. Tell us some of the main points about malocclusion. And again, normalization. We just think all of this stuff is normal because it's, all of us have experienced getting our wisdom teeth out, crooked teeth, braces, uh, face gear, whatever. You know what I mean? Like we've all yep. experienced that at this point. Yep. So in the presentation, I was I put together some visuals because I think the visuals help get this idea across um, the, the best. But in general, most people think malocclusion is just genetics. However, malocclusion, according to, you know, the evidence, even general agreement of tongue among like top anthropologists, where there's not a ton of agreement always, they tend to agree that this malocclusion has occurred in the evolutionary blink of an eye. It, the, the evidence for this just being a genetic trait that we're passing on is, is very weak. So what is causing it if it's not just genetics that we're having malocclusion? And I think Robert Corsini has done some of the best research on this. Like he's, he literally, literally marshaled in decades of research on occlusal anomalies and occlusion is like how our teeth fit together, how they come in. And basically what we noticed is during the industrial revolution, we start to see, start seeing crooked teeth and like, what's going on. Uh, and the overwhelming, I would say evidence suggests that it is the modern diet the switch, switch to these modern diets, refined foods. Uh, but I think what's tricky with malocclusion is there's this primary cause, which I would say dietary, we changed our food. And because we changed our food, we also changed how we consume that food. And so what I mean by that is eating steak is fundamentally like you have to chew it, right? It's different than drinking the exact same nutrition out of a bottle, right? Uh, and, I, and I liken it to, to grow your, your face properly to avoid, because the problem is our jaws aren't growing enough, right? It's called alveolar uh, deficiencies. But to grow your face fully, what you need is the nutrition and the stress. Like you're going to grow a muscle in the gym. You can't just down protein shakes and hope that your muscles are going to grow. You also have to go, go to the gym and work it out. And so a very similar, good analogy for growing your face completely. We need the nutrition, but we also need the stimulus to grow our face. And when we put these two things together, we avoid other secondary causes like mouth breathing, which will cause malocclusion. So we can go through some examples, uh, that I talked about on the presentation, one being Bender's synd syndrome, uh, which in the 1970s, uh, mother's taking warfarin and warfarin is an anticoagulant. And the way warfarin works is it inhibits vitamin K recycling. So it essentially gives you a vitamin K deficiency. And vitamin K is known as coag a coagulation vitamin. That's why, that's why the K with the coagulation is actually uh, it's, it's in another language, but that's what vitamin K came from is known as a coagulation. So if you have a vitamin K deficiency, it will prevent you from coagulating, getting um, a thrombus and having a stroke or whatever. Long story short, if you, these women that were pregnant take, take warfarin and they get a vitamin K deficiency, uh, but vitamin K is not just a coagulation vitamin. It also plays a very important role in craniofacial development, notably vitamin K2. And so these mothers would pass a vitamin K deficiency to the, to their 
fetus and, and their babies and they would develop severe mal malocclusion. So that right there just shows you like uh, nutrition plays a role without question, like is our face gonna grow to its full genetic potential or not? Uh, so that's an example from the nutrition side. On the examples from like the stress side, the, st the stimulus side is we did talk about breastfeeding. Breastfeeding is very important. One from the nutrition side, for formulas even to this day are, I mean, a lot of these formulas, you look at the ingredients, it's almost like junk food. Like, uh, so breast milk is, and I feel like this is not, it should not even be controversial whatsoever. Is like, we're mammals, like, the, like our infants are meant to eat, eat breast milk. Like that is, <laughs> that is very like, that's, no one's really arguing that I don't think. Right. So that is the ideal nutrition. Uh, but also breast feeding stimulates the oral facial muscles differently than bottle feeding even. And so very important role in, in developing the face. So that's appropriate suckling, which is important. And the third thing is chewing and chewing on a piece of steak, very different than slurping baby food off a spoon. And chewing has a number of actually important roles. One is it works these muscles. It's gonna help grow your face. Like, and number of studies show food consist con consistency impacts uh, occlusion and how your, how your teeth and, and face develops, both human and animal studies show this. Uh, but after chewing, not only are you chewing and working these muscles, you are also having a proper swallow after you chew, after you chew. So swallowing a piece of meat, also different, totally different swallowing me mechanism than swallowing Red Bull or swallowing baby food mush off a spoon, different swallowing mechanisms. So when you do a proper adult swallow, the tongue goes to the palate. You'll, you can just do it and you just, you feel the tongue go to the palate. It does like this wave motion. And every time it does that, which is 600 times a day with a proper adult swallow, it provides two pounds of force. So two, two pounds of force against the palate, 600 times a day. And that provides support to the palate. It broadens the palate it, and all the, and the tongue's role on the palate where is where it should be resting. Uh, the tip of the tongue should be resting on, on the rugae, which is if you go like behind your two front teeth, there's like these little bumpy areas. The tip of the tongue should always be resting there and the mouth should be closed. And the tongue plays a very important role as acting like a natural orthodontic retainer. But if you're never chewing and you're not, and you don't develop a proper adult swallow, uh, uh, this often can lead to uh, a slack jaw, mouth breathing, and the sequela of malocclusion. And I think there's some, the, the really interesting experiments are Dr. Eagle Harvold from, uh, he did these experiments in the eighties and he plugged monkeys noses with uh some, some silicone just so they to force them to mouth breathe and like these monkeys normally they their mouth is shut they breathe through their nose and they develop normal occlusion but he blocked their noses forced them to mouth breathe and you know what they grew these long narrow faces and malocclusion uh so we got a number of these studies that show the various potential secondary causes is what i call them mouth breathing uh but to me, the fundamental issue is improper diet. If you're eating the proper diet, if you're breastfed as an infant, and then you move on to what I would believe uh, a meat-based diet, you're going to be chewing, you have the nutrition and the forces to fully develop your jaws. Yeah. Yeah. Our former guest, James Nestor, who authored the book, uh, Breathe. Um, he's a breathe of breath. Now I can't remember. But anyway, he talks about how he did that experiment at Stanford where they plugged his nose, him yep. and, and one of his fellow um, scientists for a week. And the, the, it sounded awful. Really terrible. Fantastic book, by the way. Uh, I was actually thinking about it earlier today. Uh, think about going on the podcast. And an example I was going to, it just came to mind was I was reading that book and uh, Dr. Dan Lieberman's book at the same time. Dr. Dan Lieberman is an academic. The book is thick, it is so dense. And Breath is, I would say, more of a layman's read, a bestseller, great book. And I, when I was thinking about, because when I was making the presentation, I wanted to be accessible. And I, I thought of these two books. I'm like, I love Dr. Daniel Lieberman's work and his books. And I can read it, but like 99 of a hundred people. No, no, thank you. And so I was like, I, I was funneling my James Nestor when I was trying to make that presentation and be like, how, you know, how would, because he's a journalist. I'm like, how would a journalist portray this information to make it educational, but also engaging uh, so it can stick with you. Uh, so I was actually thinking about him recently, uh, but yeah, fantastic book. Yeah, very accessible. And I would say you succeeded at that goal, which is awesome. Yeah, so I guess, <clears throat> totally lost my train of thought. Oh, we're, malocclusion, I, I've just been uh, on a rant. 
No, it's it's been so good to learn about. And again, I think this is really fascinating for people to know. You talked about the position of the tongue and yeah, your visuals that you've got in the presentation showed it as like this lattice supporting everything. And most people think the tongue should be resting at the bottom of the mouth, but it actually, like you said, needs to rest at the top. And if you want to train that, practice nasal breathing, practice mouth taping. There's ways that you can figure that out to at least help. I know you're not the biggest fan of like long-term mouth taping during sleep, but it's at least a tool that can be used maybe on a walk or a light exercise where you can just start to train your, your nose to do the breathing the way it's supposed to. Yeah. And I'm definitely not against mouth taping whatsoever. I think it's a fantastic tool to help people uh, breathe through the nose when they're sleeping, especially. My concern with mouth taping is just having practice in dental sleep medicine and treating, you know, sleep disorder breathing. Many of these people that are mouth breathing at night have a, a obstructed airways. And I think mouth taping can help unobstruct the airway a little bit because it just makes you a nasal breather, which in itself is going to help open up the airway. Uh, but from the, the research is like, Hey, mouth tape is not going to fix your occluded airway and occluded airway can be very serious. And so I'm just always hesitant to be like, Hey, don't mask a problem. Like if you have an occluded airway, we need to open that airway up, make sure it's open. Uh, yeah. and so I definitely, I mean, nasal breathing needs to be a part of that solution. So maybe mouth tape is a part of that solution, but it might not be the complete solution. If someone does have a, an obstructed airway. There you go. Well, that's very well explained and reasonable. Clue two and clue three are very much linked. Like the, yeah. the small jaws are very much linked to the poor sleep. Uh, and so that's, that's what I wanted to ask you. you. You mentioned your visuals and it is amazing to see. You really should see. We'll link to either some Weston A. Price information and some of the photos that he took in writing his book, or if there's some that you recommend, we can post that. But can you describe what a, a normal human face should look like and what our faces now look like due to some of the changes in our environment, including diet and the way that we breathe? Yeah. And in the presentation, we can definitely link the the presentation and just so they can see the visuals from, from the presentation. I just use myself as an example because unfortunately I am a prototype example of what the modern diet can do to a face. Uh, so, and I've gotten better at smiling, not so big. So you don't see the gummy smile, but s some of the things that we see is like this long, narrow face, malocclusion. I had braces. I had my wisdom teeth had to take, be taken out. I had headgear. Um, and so I, I, some of those visuals are in the presentation, but also the visual of a rendering that I uh, made that would show my face if it looked proper <laughs> from the profile. So I'd have full jaws out of full maxilla and a full mandible and what that looks like versus what I currently look at, like my jaw has moved retronathic, which means back as well as, um, so, and that's very common. You just start, when you see this presentation and you just start looking at people, you just start seeing it everywhere. You're like, whoa, retronathic, retronathic. Well, retronathic jaw, which we can probably talk about more about in a second when we talk about airway, but that means the jaw is moving backward, backwards, which closes down the size of the airway. But also in the maxilla, I have, I have uh, max, maxillary insufficiency. And so that just basically means my maxilla hasn't come forward as far as it should. And I had headgear. And one of the rules of headgear is to prevent the maxilla from moving forward. So orthodontics often is saying your mouth is too small. So teeth are erupting wherever they can fit in. Often we have to take teeth out and then they move everything back to align it all. And headgear is saying, hey, this jaw is too far back. We need to hold the upper jaw back as well to make sure they match. And so I also have this maxillary insufficiency. How much of that was due to headgear versus just, it was going to happen anyways. I don't know. But, uh, so, and also, which I think is interesting. If you look at the profile of it, uh, from that, from that video, like my upper lip, you can see the upper lip starts to disappearing. And there's like a huge demand for these like dermal fillers, like making your lips bigger. And one of the reasons is like, if your jaws are recessed, it's going to make your lips appear flatter. If your jaws are full, your lips will sit in a way where they just appear more full. And then of course I show like, the, the continued trajectory of my face continues to go the way it's been going for a few more, you know, generations. Uh, it's not a pretty picture. It gets, it gets worse and worse. It's really striking. It's really interesting to see. So those visuals will be really helpful. And yeah, if, if we've kind of covered that subject, let's move on to talk about the airway. How is all of this impacting the way that we breathe? So the airway, and this to me was when I was in dental school, I found out about sleep apnea and notably dentist role that they can play in this. So 
obstructive sleep apnea, specifically sleep disordered breathing, and we can go through what these terms are and what makes them different. But over, according to the American Academy of Sleep Medicine, over a quarter of adult of U.S. adults have sleep disordered breathing, and so that basically means our airways are too small, and so oxygen, so we're not we're breathing ineffectively, and so a huge amount of people have it. It is very very damaging. So we'll go through how, how it all works and things like that. But it's very very damaging. The gold standard treatment that people have had since uh, 70s, really 80s has been CPAP and it's continue, continuous positive air, airway pressure. And if anyone that's not familiar with it, it's a mask. It pumps air down your airway. It's a pneumatic, pneumatic splinting of the airway. It is uncomfortable as it sounds. So most people, even though they're dying in their sleep, they can't, they can't tolerate it. Over 50% of the people that, that are prescribed to CPAP uh, don't wear it. So we have this huge problem very serious consequences, treatment option most people can't tolerate. And I learned about, I don't think in dental school, we learned about this at all, to tell you the truth. I fell down an independent rabbit hole. Uh, but I learned about dentists can create these oral appliances, do oral appliance therapy that holds the jaw in a forward position that helps open the up and open up the airway. Like if you've been taught CPR, lift the jaw to open the airway, similar mechanism. So I fell down this rabbit hole. And when I graduated dental school, I did something. I'm pretty sure this has never been done before, but I just opened up a practice to exclusively treat this problem. And on the side, I was working for another company uh, doing pediatric dentistry a couple of days a week. And I, I enjoy pediatric dentistry to this day. I've still, I still do pediatric dentistry part-time, but so I, I've been treating sleep disorder breathing uh, since that was 2013 is when I graduated from dental school. So it's been a decade. <laughs> uh, and so some of the terms sleep disorder breathing ranges from upper airway resistance syndrome, which is basically snoring. And that just means our airway is getting smaller and smaller and smaller to the point where uh, there's resistance. And we hear that resistance as snoring. Okay. Those are pretty much synonymous. But then on the other end of the spectrum is severe obstructive sleep apnea. And severe obstructive sleep apnea means apnea means cessation of breath. So that is when the airway closes down. You're trying to breathe, no air is being exchanged. And then apnea, uh, that will drop your oxygen, the, the blood oxygen. So that's basically how it's de defined. There's also, uh, there's a apnea, hypopnea index, a hypopnea index. Uh, hypopnea is basically a partial apnea where the airway is shutting down, maybe not totally shut, but shutting down to such a degree that it's causing the oxygen in your blood to drop a significant percentage. So that is in, in, in essence, what sleep disorder breathing is. Dentists can treat it with a oral device uh, but it's a serious problem. And, uh, so that's what, you know, I spent, that's why I dove in head first. I thought that, Hey, there's nothing more important I could be working on. So yeah. And it's really, it's caused by basically two things and it's caused by a, a mouth that is too small. And then we have a tongue that is then too big for its home. And there's only two places for the tongue to go. It could go forward which is going to require you to open your mouth to get that tongue out. And like, we just talked about the consequences of open, open mouth posture and malocclusion. So there's a, there's a parallel here, but the other escape route is back, right? And that's where your airway is. And so with sleep apnea, the tongue tends to take the back escape route and it falls back in your throat and it blocks the airway along with the soft palate. So uh, that's what causes it. A, a combination of two small of mouths, which we talked about clue number two, as well as too big of a tongue and or supporting tissues, which is really what we're talking about is obesity here. Because when we have a overweight obesity, the body's putting energy into fat wherever it can find. And the tongue is one of those places. And so the tongue will start taking up, will start growing. Basically you start to get fatty tongue is what I call it. And so a small mouth with a fatty tongue, you, you're in trouble. The tongue's going to take the back escape route and you're going to get sleep apnea. Yeah, I don't think a lot of people realize that the tongue is more tissue that it can actually get fat. It's quite striking to see in the photos and the photos that you saw, showed, but I have to say the video that you showed us was incredible. Can you describe that video for, to, for somebody? Yeah, so the video is a guy getting a PSG, which is a sleep study. So he's hooked up to all these wires. They're doing a sleep study to see if he has sleep apnea. Look, I can tell you, I could have just looked at him and told you he had sleep apnea. But the, the, so they're doing the test on him. And so there's a video of this guy sleeping. And he's, you can see the beginning of the, the video, he's struggling to breathe. And so his mouth is open and the tongue is out of the mouth. So I say the tongue is taking the forward escape route. But as you fall into a, a deeper level of sleep, what happens is the mouth closes and the tongue takes the back escape route. 
And so he's in this video, he's asleep and we can confirm that he's asleep by with, the, with all the wires in the sleep study. And you can see like there's a respiratory effort, like he's trying to breathe, but there's the airway's totally blocked. So he's, he's not breathing. And you know, it goes on for over 35 seconds, not breathing. And the, during the presentation, I challenged everyone there. I'm like, Hey, try and compete with this guy and hold your breath for 35 seconds. And it's when you do that, you're like, Whoa. And so after 35 seconds, what happens and to this man in this situation, uh, and when you have sleep apnea is the body doesn't want you to suffocate and die. It senses that the oxygen in the blood has plummeted and you need to breathe. So what happens is it's a very stressful situation for the body. So luckily, luckily our body's there to save us. And what it does is it basically, um, releases a cocktail of stress hormones to get you to reestablish muscle tone, to get the tongue out of the airway so you can breathe again. So in the video at 35 seconds, you see the guy <laughs> gasp for air. Right. And what's interesting, if I, if I had more time in the presentation, I could have just let this play for another couple of minutes. Cause what you see is it just repeats. Like he, he's, he, he gasps, he gets air and then he continues labored breathing and then it shuts down again. And so this is obstructive sleep apnea. And this happens all night long, night after night. And for someone with severe sleep apnea, that means that's happening 30 plus times every single hour suffocation, stress, suffocation, stress all night long. So it is a very, very serious sleep disorder. Uh, and a lot of people have it and there's not a lot of good treatment options. So that's why I've been very passionate about this area for the last decade. Yeah, that's amazing. I just thinking about the, the cocktail of stress hormones. That's exactly what you want when you're sleeping. Like, give me a break. It's exactly. terrible. <laughs> and then, and then, you know, that begs the question of mental health and all the anxiety and depression. And we're having this huge epidemic of mental health. Well, no wonder if you're not getting good restorative sleep every night, you're, you're not going to feel good. I'll tell you what, almost what sticks in my memory more than anything is I'm 26 years old. I started private practice, just treating sleep apnea. And every patient, you know, we take a health history, et cetera. It seemed like every single patient I treated was on antidepressants. Oh, like, and, and that's what stands out to me almost more than anything. And the research bears this out. Like, if you have obstructive sleep apnea, the comorbidities of with obstructive sleep apnea, it basically makes everything worse. So, like, if you're predisposed to high blood pressure, you're going to have high blood pressure. It's going to make it worse. Consequently, if you treat obstructive sleep apnea, you tend to see people's blood pressure drop. Uh, because if you just talk, like we're just talking about, it's a stress response all night long. So your basal tone of stress throughout the day, like your heart rate variability, which we could talk more about, but your heart rate variability is basically going to be crushed. Like if you have obstructive sleep apnea, uh, and your risk for basically everything, cardiovascular disease, it's really hard on the heart as well as the associations with, uh, dementia because the brain is and oxygen hungry and you're shutting it down from oxygen and the night time is when a lot of this brain cleaning is happening right um so yeah it's associated with all these comorbidities it basically makes yeah. everything worse terrible wow okay so you've given us these three clues you kind of gave away the ending in the very beginning um <laughs> I think people might know where you go with this, but what are your concluding thoughts? What would you want somebody to walk away from this presentation um, knowing and wanting to implement in their life? You, you know, the way I conclude the presentation, I might as well just not, may not come up with anything new here is like, I think, you know, Dr. Weston A. Price, he's a fellow dentist, you know, a nutritional hero a hundred years ago. Uh, I, I think he really, I mean, he, he gives us these three clues in a way. So for example, Dr. Western Price, for anyone that doesn't know, he traveled the world in the 1930s at a time when there was the intersection of like traditional indigenous diets and this new modern diet with lots of flour and sugar. And so he literally traveled the world, uh, five continents, and he studied, hey, this is a traditional diet. Let me look at their oral health. This is a modern diet. Let me look at their oral health. And when, especially the modern diet encroached on a traditional diet. And what he found was one for clue number one, was when a, a group of people eating their traditional indigenous diet, when modern food first arri ar arrived in these places, they, they developed cavities right away. But what he noticed for clue number two is the second generation post-adoption of these modern foods, they got malocclusion. That was our clue number two. So it's not genetic, right? They're not passing down that, that malocclusion. Uh, and then he gives a clue about number three, but he doesn't really talk about obesity at all throughout the entire, throughout all of his work. And 
the reason is because in the 1930s, their obesity wasn't much of a problem. And, and you're like, hey, why not? We're eating all this flour and all this sugar. Shouldn't we be obese? And in the presentation, I go through a, a, an explanation of how I think, yes, sugar and refined carbs, I think exacerbate the problem with obesity. But I actually think the fundamental problem perhaps is uh, is the kind of fats we're eating today. So these vegetable seed oils, high yeah. linoleic acid that I believe is driving uh, the the obesity epidemic obesity epidemic. And when you put sugar and refined carbs, plus these high omega-6 linoleic acid diets, you know, kind of typified by these vegetable seed oils that are in everything that make up 30% of the modern diet. I actually think that's driving uh, obesity the most. And in, in the presentation, my two hour presentation version that I had to cut down, I wanted to like go deep into that because I feel like that's where a lot of pushback is going to be. Uh, and there's a lot of evidence for that. So I wanted to go down that rabbit hole, but that, that would, that is a deep rabbit hole. Uh, so I avoided that. I presented some of the compelling correlation data, as well as some interventional trials, uh, and left it up to Dr. Price, who said, Hey, I saw the cavities. I saw the malocclusion, but he never mentions overeating or obesity. Why not? And that's because in the 1930s, uh, these novel vegetable seed oil fats were the new kids on the block. Like they made up a far smaller percentage of the, the displacing foods of modern commerce as Dr. Price called them. Uh, but now, like I said, they make up over a quarter of the, of the standard American diet. Yeah, no, that's wonderful. I have Dr. Weston's book um, about five inches away from my head right now. It's really wonderful. And, and again, the visualizations are amazing. I also have Dr. Chris Kenobi's book, The Ancestral Diet Revolution. And, you know, I asked him personally, like, am I going to be attending KetoCon next year? Or am I going to be attending No Seed Oil Con or whatever, you know, like the, the, Seed Oil Denver or whatever? Like, it's it's funny to think that, you know, maybe a low carbohydrate diet has so many benefits because it also eliminates the seed oils. And he did a good job explaining how both of them are corporate culprits kind of together. Well, yeah. And I think, well, a low carbohydrate diet alone may not eliminate the seed oils. What I think that is the important thing when we look at the mouth and the way I like to present these three clues is that if you just got rid of seed oils, man, you could still have a big problem with cavities, right? There's still something going wrong, right? So you actually need the low carb and the low omega-6 predominant linoleic acid. But when you have that, you have the recipe, right? But what do you get if you eat a low carb diet and you get rid of omega-6, like if you greatly reduce these omega-6 fats? If, if you ask yourself that question and you just actually just follow a diet like that, well, what you're going to find, you're going to back yourself up into a meat-based diet and like almost like it's almost unavoidable at that point because you could eat like a lot of vegetables, for example, but you will, you will be starving. <laughs> so like you will need the meat. Uh, you'll just be driven to eat meat. So yeah, the conclusion to, to me is like, if we get rid of I mean, we know carbohydrates are causing the cavity. So if we eat low carb, that's clue number one. We get clue number three, we get rid of the or limit the omega-6 fatty acids. But also clue number two, how do we fully develop our jaws? You got to eat the high bioavailable nutrition that requires species appropriate suckling and chewing. Now, if you do all of that, there's no way that you land anywhere but a meat-based diet. So that that that's the conclusions. If you follow the clues to their logical conclusion, like I, I feel like all dentists need to be recommending a meat-based diet. And if they're not, then I don't feel like they're doing the patients the like they're not prevent like if our job is to help our patients have oral health, like diet is primary importance. And like this is the kind of diet that's going to get you there. Yeah, dude, what a perfect way to end this conversation. You've been so generous with your time and so educational. I think people walk away with some really good actionable items because again, all of these things have been normalized and so many people deal with them. And so it's a really important message and it makes connections where I don't think people would make them on their own. So really appreciate you and your work and all the research that went into that presentation. But where would you like people to go to find you and connect with you and your work? Hey, I would. I just think uh, a good sequel to this would be checking out the presentation so you can see some of the visuals. Uh, I'm getting it all edited up real nicely. So it should be all ready by the time uh, this comes out. So yeah, I would check that out. And if you start there, then you'll be in good shape. <laughs> That's great. Okay, awesome. So we'll link that as soon as we have the notes for the listener. So if you just send that over to me when it's all done, I'll make sure it's linked up in the notes. Absolutely, will do. 
Dude, that's great. Kevin, it was so great to catch up. It's it's such a joy to hear your content and all the different ways you're connecting with people um, and meeting people where they are. Like I said, the introduction, I, your newsletter is fantastic. I subscribe to maybe like three or four. I'm trying to unsubscribe from as many things as possible, but I absolutely love yours. And I think anybody would be uh, benefited from signing up for that. We also have a link for that in the notes as well. So the listener can sign up for that. It is brief. It is important. Um, it's It's relevant. And it doesn't suck. It's really, really good. I know you put a lot of time and work into it. So thank you so very much for everything you do. And thank you for taking the time to be on our show today. We really appreciate you. Thank you for having me on. I mean, I really enjoy talking with you. And thanks for the kind words uh, and, and for checking out the newsletter. That means a lot. I know no one needs an extra email. So I uh, appreciate you taking the time to check that out. Uh, it means a lot. It's very non-annoying. I think everybody should subscribe to it. They'll learn about something or at least, again, find out what you're doing with your yearly challenges, which is always really inspiring. So again, (laughs) thank you so very much for taking the time to be on our show today. Thanks, Casey. Absolutely. And this has been another episode of Boundless Body Radio.